Okay, let's continue our review. All right, please. Shh. Okay, please close your phone, Sanim. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Let's get started again. All right, I did some question answering during the break. I always encourage you, if you have anything you don't understand, to come up during the break and um, ask questions about it. Okay, so here's a brief explanation of this. G is equal to H plus some value in memory. So I have a, a, a value in register, and I want to add it to a value in memory, and I want to put the result in uh, a value in register. So I have to uh, load in the value from memory first into register, so that's what I'm doing. I bring it into T0, and then I do this addition of the memory value with the register value and put the result in the register. Can you see that? This takes two assembly operations because we refuse to do arithmetic on memory values. So the first operation brings a memory value in to become a register value, and then we do our arithmetic on all register values, OK? Now, you might say, well, hold your two instructions is slower than one. Wouldn't it be better to do the one and allow it to reach into memory to get an operand? And that's a very good question. And the answer is, if it's faster, let's do it that way. If it's slower, let's do it this way. But not just for this one. We have to look at thousands of lines of code and thousands of programs and profile what software does and find out how common is it to need an operand from memory. In fact, why couldn't the compiler put that operand in register? Maybe you didn't have enough registers. It needed to use memory. Could be a lot of reasons. But uh, the risk revolution is all about optimizing the compilers to use simple instructions and make the common case fast, such as all register operands, and occasionally have a slow case. This takes two instructions. Okay? This one's going to be slow because it goes to memory. This one's going to be fast. So we've got a slow one and a fast one, as opposed to a single slow one. If you allow this to be here, and allow you to get one register operand and one memory operation, I guarantee you that's going to be slow. Because you're trying to both go to memory and do the addition in the same instruction. This way we only go to memory, and this way we only do the addition. Turns out you can actually pipeline these kind of instructions and get some speed up. So it's not as slow as it looks. All right, that's called the base register, S3. Why is it called the base? Why is it called the Tamel? I didn't hear. What, what was your answer to the question? What was your answer? I asked a question, you were answering it? Well, I thought you were talking. You weren't answering the question? What were you doing then? What were you talking about? OK. All right. Let's, let's try to keep personal discussions in this direction so that everybody can be a part of them. It might be that everybody needs to benefit from that, but let's try not to have little personal huddles in the class, OK? All right, let's ask a question again. Why is S3 called the base register? And this time I am asking you. Yeah. Why, why would the word base register be a good name for S3? Yeah, it's part of the address, isn't it? 32 is going to be part of it, and the value stored in S3 is going to be the other part of it. So it's the base or the TML of the address that we're going to go get data from. So it's the base register for the calculation. Is it the whole thing? Yes, if I put a zero here, but it's only part of it. So it's the base of the calculation. Add 32, now we have the full address. We go get the data from memory in that location and store it here. OK, so that's when we have a memory operand. Uh, this is called the offset, so the base address plus the offset, which can be positive or negative, allows us to calculate the full address. Okay? Here's a second one. Now notice here, I've got a memory operand and a memory destination. Can you guess what I'm going to have to do here? Don't look. Can you guess what I'm going to have to do? That's in memory, but I can't add or operate on anything in memory, can I? So I'm going to have to bring it into register, add it to this, and, and get a what? A register result. But it's supposed to be uh, in memory. So what am I going to need to do? Store it back. So just as you expect, first bring it in, do the operation, then store it back. OK? All right. So that's how it works. Oh, and just notice one more thing here. An offset of eight words is an offset of 32 bytes. An offset of 12 words is an offset of 48 bytes. Does everybody see the relation between this and this? Tell me, can anybody tell me the base? This is obviously an array structure named A. And it's got you know, members from A0 
all the way down to A, whatever the nth one is, okay? So we're interested in A8, and we're interested in A12, okay? There's a bunch of other ones besides those, but we're just interested in A8 and A12. Now, this is a high-level language from C code, so if this is an integer, how many bits will it be? 32 bits. How many bytes is that? Four bytes. So if this is an integer, how many bits will it be? 32 bits. How many bytes? Four bytes. Okay, great. So now, if A0 in my abstract data structure called array is located at some address, where is A1 located? The next word address, but in terms of bytes, four bytes later. Because this takes four bytes to store a word, and this takes four bytes, and this takes four bytes. So when I get to A8, it's this address plus 32 more bytes. When I get to A12, it's this address plus 48 more bytes. All right, now the last question is, where do I find the address of A0? Where's the starting address of this array in memory? Where's the starting address of this array in memory? Where's the memory address that addresses where the first byte of A0 is stored? The answer is it's inside S3. That's the pointer. S3 by itself points to right here, the base of the array. So that's another reason for calling it the base address. It's the base of the structure. And then you need to know what? The offset. You need to know how far away is that, how far away is that. OK, that's pretty significant. I'm going to tell you, half of you will make mistakes for quite a while figuring out that eight words doesn't equal eight bytes. It equals 32 bytes. And 12 words doesn't equal 12 bytes. It equals 48 bytes. But you have to remember that, or your code at the assembly language level is berbat. It's useless. It's junk. It's trip. OK, you must remember that. A word is 32 bits, therefore it's four bytes. At the assembly level, we're talking about addressing bytes because memory is byte addressable. Can everybody see that high level doesn't even know about bytes? Low level only knows about bytes. This is closer to the machine. It sees the real memory. This is some kind of abstract data structure, right? ADT, abstract data type, CS201202. You know lots of them. They're all abstract. Why is it called abstract? Kopmush from the reality of real memory. I think that's the way I would define it. I'm a hardware guy. So anything abstract is kopmush from reality. It means there's a lovely gap, and you don't have to worry about how that gap is filled. But oh, Zavala says now you're into 24, and you do have to worry about how that gap is filled. Abstract things have to become real and practical. You have to understand how they're mapped into memory. Now, an array is pretty easy. Because an array, everybody knows, after the first element is the second element, after the second element is the third element, after the third is the fourth, they're pretty easy. Let's worry about linked lists and trees later, okay? You've got to map those into real memory also. Oh, no, Hoja, I couldn't even get them when they're abstract, let alone real. Please, Hoja. Oh, that's fine. Well, don't worry, we'll, we'll save you that pain until a little bit later. But all data types, if they're not already built into the machine as physical original types offered by the machine, are therefore abstract, and the gap between abstract and physical, what the machine offers and what you want at the high level, is filled by the assembly. What have we done here? We added two instructions that weren't here in order to fill the gap. That and that are because high level allows operation on memory operands, and low level doesn't. Low level only allows operation on register operands. OK, now you're beginning to say, uh, Hoji, is this there's really mejbur? Do I really have to take it as a must? I don't like it. It's getting nasty. There's some things here that are painful because they're real. It was so nice to just drift around in the lovely world of abstract data types. Now you're telling me they all have to be rooted in reality. Yeah, they do because they all live in real memory. They all live in real memory. Okay? So, um, this is what I, I enjoy. I enjoy breaking people's pembe, you know, <laughs> garouche and showing them the hard realities of how computers really work. All right, let's go on. OK, our I format, as you remember, the immediate format says opcode, register, register, immediate. OK? Now look what I got here. Opcode, register, register, and an immediate. OK, so you can guess that the offset is going to be here, and the base register is going to be one of these, and the destination register is going to be the other one, and that's the code for load word. Right? To be honest with you, I don't actually remember if this one maps to that or that one maps to that. 
I think the T's begin with 8, so the T0 is 8, therefore the S3 is this one here. So RS and RD, no T. So RS stands for source. Yeah, that's a source of the calculation. That's the destination. Makes sense, OK? Remember, when we don't have RD, then RT functions as my destination. When I do have RD, then RT is a Kardash with RS. It's one of the sources. Remember the three registers? Oh, I'm running out of room here. Remember the three registers? In the R format, they go like this. RS, RT, RD. When you have them all, these are Kardash. When you get rid of this one, this one functions not as a Kardash. It functions as the destination. OK, got it? RT goes both ways. OK, functions as a destination when it has to, functions as a source when it needs to. OK, all right, we just have op, RS, RT, immediate. So this is my destination. So that's the code. 8 is the code for T0. Any questions about that? All right. So the load words code is 35, the S3's code is 19, the 24's code is 24, but notice there's a little cheat here. It says 24 base 10. What's the real thing going to be there? What's the real thing going to be there? Cipher, 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 until we get down to the last bits, and then what? A 1 in the place for the 16, and a 1 in place for the 8, and then cipher, 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 right? Everybody know that? You know? EQ's very dirt. Iq is very uch, Iq is very ki, Iq is very big. What do I need? I need a one there, a one there, a zero, a zero, a zero. So it's all going to be zeros except for that, right? Are we okay? So, cipher, 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 beer, beer, cipher, cipher, cipher. That's the real code. They just wrote a base 10 number there so that you don't have to worry about conversion to binary. But you know what? You do have to worry about conversion to binary. We are down in the bits in this course. So I sure hope everybody took our warnings in CS223 and learn their binary really well so that there's not any problems in your mind between conversions between base 10 and binary numbers. You're really going to need it in this course. If you didn't, one more time go back and learn how to work with binary arithmetic and binary numbers. Lutfen. Okay, so this says add 24 to the value found in S3. So if everybody can notice that if S3 points here, adding 24 bytes to that is going to move me forward how many words? Six. Six words. Now, you notice that these are not bytes of memory. They put words of memory, I think, here. Is that right? Yeah. Can you tell? Because look, cipher, then dirt, then eight, then j, then cipher, then yeah. OK, so these are actually 32 bits of memory, which means that they took my byte-wide diagram and placed four of them together and wrote it out. So actually, six more. And, 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 and yeah, from this address is going to get us to some location, which is going to be that. And that value is going to be fetched out and loaded into register T0. So there's the arithmetic to do it. So I notice uh, it's in ones and zeros. Can you see here that this is the 9, 4 from there? That's hexadecimal. So 9, 4 is added, which was this, is added to. 24, and you can see there's the 16 and there's the 8, so there's the 24, but base 10, 24 is beer secis in, in um, uh, octal. So beer secis added to 94 gives this number, and that's ending in AC. And where do we have it? Oh, we're adding. I'm sorry, is this going down? Yeah, so it would be up this way. So add six more, and you get up somewhere in here. All right. I've said this before about byte addresses, so I'm, I'm going to skip big endy and little endy, and it's up to you, of course, to come back and review the slides. MIPS has special instructions if you don't want to load in a whole word, if you just want to load in a byte, LB, whole word, LW. What do you think LB does? Load a byte. Where does it get the byte? Gets it from there. Where does it stick it? Sticks it there. But that's not a byte. That's a 32-bit register. So we said get a byte from here. What do you think it's going to do? It's going to get one byte from memory. And it's going to stick that byte in this 32-bit word where? And what's it going to do with the other 24 bits? Zero. Yeah, fill the other 24 with 0. So now the only question is, OK, so I'm going to stick it into a 32-bit word. I've got four places I might stick it. Most significant, second most, third most, least significant. Where do you think I'm going to stick the byte that I got? Right there, least significant. 
This will all be filled with zeros, and the byte from memory will go right in there. That's load byte. All right, how about store byte? What do you think that's going to do? Store a byte to memory. Now it says, start with the value in T0, Kojimon 32-bit word. What byte shall I take? That one, that one, that one, or that one? Which byte shall I take? That one. And store it to where? Exactly that byte address in memory. Not the 7, 8, 9, 10. Those are not involved. Only that plus 6. One exact byte location in memory, we store it. Okay? So if you want to work with a byte, you can. Memory is byte addressable. You can address a particular byte and get it and bring it in or write something else in it. Any questions about LBSB? OK, what do you think LH and SH do? We got a family night. We got LB. SB, we got LW, SW, that's for word, that's for byte. What do you think H is? No. <laughs> half word. Half word. So byte is 8 bits. Half word is 16 bits. Word is 32 bits. OK? So now we're dealing with two bytes, the half word. Take the half word and store it, or get the two bytes and put it in the lowest two lowest half of the word, half word, but lower half word, OK? So we got LB, LH, LW, SB, SH, SW, OK? All right. We talked about which ones get loaded and stored. Unsigned binary, you said that you knew this, and Typhoon taught it pretty well, so we won't do this review. We'll skip right through all this binary arithmetic stuff. Just be sure you know it. Just be sure you can do binary math, OK? Sign two's complement, negation, sign extension, hexadecimal. All right, now we've come to immediate numbers. And obviously, this says I need a 4. This says I need a 15. So I've got to stick the 4 in here, stick the 15 in here, right? So the number has to be there. So ADDI says add this register and the value 4 and put it there. SLTI says set if less than with an immediate operand instead of two registers. SLT requires Register, register, register. SLTI requires register, register, and an immediate. Every time you see an I, expect that you won't see a register. Instead, you'll see an immediate. Okay? So this says, if S2 is less than 15, set T0. What does it mean, set T0? T0 equals 1. You set it to 1. Pecky, if it's not, set it to 0. Clear it to 0. Don't leave it alone. This means we're going to change T0. When you're done with this, it's either going to be cipher, because it wasn't less than that, or it's going to be 1, because it was less than that. If you're equal, is it going to be set to 0 or 1? 0, because it's not less than. It says less than to set. If they're equal, it's not less than. So you don't set. You clear it to 0. Okay? So that's the meaning of SLT. If I have ADD, I expect register, register, register. Put an I in, I expect register, register, immediate. Same thing with all of them. If you see the I, the third one should be an immediate and the format will be the I format, OK? All right, now you can see that the value 15 is stored here in the immediate field. So that means it's this instruction. So therefore, S2 is 18, and T0 is register 8, and the code for SLTI is 0, 0, 0, 0. Hold on, there's a, that's a 6-bit number. Let's work out what that is, 0A. If this is a hexadecimal number, and that's what this means, 0a, and it's a 6-bit number, tell me the value of those 6 bits. What are the value of the 6 bits? a's code is 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. yeah. And 0's code is 0, 0, 0, 0, but I only have 6 bits, so what should I write? Exactly, only the least. So there we go. That's my 0, that's my A, so that's the 6 bits. That's how you translate a hexadecimal representation into its binary equivalent. It can't be an 8-bit thing. That's 4, but that can't be 4 because it's a 6-bit field. Okay? All right. So there's the machine format. So we're beginning to learn how to translate assembly language instructions into their binary equivalent. What do we call a binary instruction when its in values are ones and zeros. We call it a machine language instruction. Assembly language translates into machine language. If I filled that out with ones and zeros, 
Instead of these codes, it would be a machine language instruction which says, do this. Okay? Okay? All right. So now we've moved from high level language to assembly, and now we're building the bridge to machine language, ones and zeros. Ugly, ugly. This is a little cleaner. This is even a little nicer. But some of you are saying, oh, give me the days when C and Java. I, I thought I didn't like them, but now I really love them compared to this stuff. You know, I'm going to make you love high level languages by the end of this course, I think. All right, let's go on. Uh, so the constant is inside the instruction itself. So now we've got three places where you can find operands. You can find an operand in memory, but you have to bring it into the register before you can actually use it. You can find an operand in CPU registers, and you can find an operand right in the instruction itself. The operand is in the instruction. So when you fetch the instruction in from memory, the operand came with it. And it's actually in a register. It's in the register that decodes the instructions, isn't it? It's not in your 32 general purpose registers. It's, it's with the instruction. There it is. There's the instruction. There's the operand. There's my 15. Those are called immediate operands. They're in the instruction, not in a separate piece of data. They are data. You will compute with them. But they're not in a separate data register or a separate location in memory. They're part of the instruction. They're called immediate operands. Lots and lots of machine, lots and lots of you know, languages use them. You write lots of code. Every time you write a number instead of a variable name, you command an immediate operand. Every time you wrote a number, loop limit is 100 repetitions, decrement by subtracting 1, whatever you did, whenever you wrote an integer or even a floating point number, you used an immediate operand. Right, now, we talked about small constants, and that's great. This will do for any number up to, you know, whatever 16 bits can accommodate. And those are common and frequent. But once in a while, there's a big constant. There's a really big number that won't fit into 16 bits. What are we going to do? We're going to need to put it in 32 bits. Well, how can we make an immediate 32-bit number? Because my immediate field doesn't fit a 32-bit number. All right, the answer is to have a new instruction which allows us to take this and stick it in the upper half, and then in a different instruction, figure out what goes in the lower half, and now you've got the whole thing. Look at that. That is a 32-bit constant. You made it in two pieces. This instruction gave you the first piece. This instruction gave you the second piece and told you to or it together with the first piece. So when you ORed this with zeros, you got it. And when you ORed this with zeros, you got it. And now they're all together in one register. So you assembled it in two pieces. So it took two instructions to mess with a large constant. Is it OK that large constants are slow to mess with? Yes, because they're rare. If you, if you said, sir, they're very common, then the answer would be, no, that's not OK at all. That's terrible, because you made the common case slow. But this is the rare case. No big deal. No problem making rare things slow. It's common things we have to make fast. OK. OK, uh, this shows C and Java and MIPS for the kind of um, logical operations. You know, symbols for shift left, we have an operation, shift left logical. Symbols for shift right, we have a shift right logical. Bitwise anding, you have those symbols. We either and things together or we and immediate things, you know, register and an immediate. Bitwise oring, we can or two registers or or one register with an immediate. Uh, nodding, you can complement or we can nor. Huh? How can I use nor to complement? Pink. How can the nor operation be used to complement? What happens if I do A nord with 0? What happens? What do I get? A complement, right? Yeah. You just nor it with the 0 register. Because oring with 0 does nothing, and the noring does the complementing. Why not just have a not operation? Now let me ask. This takes two operands, doesn't it? Fits nicely in the R format. This takes two operands, right? Fits nicely in the R format. This only takes one operand. Doesn't really fit a format that we have. 
This is back to taking two operands. Fits nicely in the R format. Regularity leads to simplicity, which leads to speed and you know easy to implement and organize. So keeping it regular, you said everything takes two operands. It's a good thing to do. All right. Uh, shifting operations allow us to isolate a set of bits within a word. So we can shift left logical and shift right logical. Look what's going on here. This says shift this eight bits to the left and put the result here. This says shift this eight bits to the right and put the result here. When we do logical shifting and you move things, what goes in the empty new locations? Zeros. When you do arithmetic shifting, what goes in the empty locations? Arithmetic shifting. Not logical. SLL says shift left logical. What if I had SRA, shift right arithmetic? So I'm going to do a right shift. What's a right shift do? Moves things that way. I get empty places here. What should I fill in for arithmetic shifting? Most significant bit. If it was a 1, it means I've got a negative number. When I shift it, I need to fill in 1s to keep it negative. If it was a 0, when I shift it, I need to fill in zeros to keep it positive. Ah, arithmetic shifting says, this is a number. You've got to preserve the sign of the number. Logical shifting says, that's not a number. It's just a set of bits. Stick in the zeros. We don't care. What would happen if you took a negative number, shifted it to the right, and filled in zeros? You turned it into a positive number. Yeah. yeah. You, didn't, you didn't divide it by some integer. You changed it and messed it up. Okay, so we've got to remember that. Okay, the format for shift operations is the R format. This says it's one of those. This says which one. All right. Out of many, there's six bits here, so that means there's what is it, 63 different possibilities. This one is the one for shifting. This says how much to shift, 8 bits. This is the shift amount field. It says how much to shift. This says the source, so it's T2 is the one getting the shifting, I guess. No, I'm sorry about that. Uh, that's S0. So uh, S0 is getting the shifting. That's the source. The destination is the T2 register, which is 10. That's where I'm putting the result. So I'm shifting this, this many bits, and putting it there. Shifting this, this many bits, and putting it there. Any questions about shifting left, shifting right? Yes? It's left blank. It's not meaningful. Yeah, it's ignored. Maybe you should make zeros there. Yeah, it doesn't say, but apparently it's not decoded and it doesn't affect the operation. These are called logical shifts. Notice that the biggest amount of shifts you'll ever need is 31, so 5 bits is enough because it's a 32 bit word. If you shift it 32 bits, you just cleared it to zero. If you shift it 31 or 30 or 29 or 28, you're holding on to some of the information. So the largest number of shifts you'll need is 31 bit position shift. Okay, and, or, and, nor, or bitwise logical. I think it's pretty clear how they work. They're all or form, or R format. If you want to make immediate versions of them, we have and I and or I, and those will be like this with a, a constant instead of a register value. So you'll and this value with this and put the result here. You'll or this value with this and put the result here. There's a little problem that could happen here. This is a 32-bit quantity. How many bits is this? How many bits is this? 16, yeah. Hex, that's 4 bits. Hex, 4 bits more, 4 bits more, 4 bits more. It's only 16 bits. It can't only be 16 bits. So how do I or or and a 16-bit quantity with a 32-bit quantity? How can I do that? The answer is I can't directly. I either have to transform this into a 16-bit quantity or transform this into a 32-bit quantity. Which one do you think I'm going to do? Yeah, I'm going to take this 16 bits and I'm going to make it a 32-bit thing and then do the and or then do the or. How do I transform a 16-bit quantity into a 32-bit quantity? I extend with 16 extra places. What should I put in those 16 extra places? Zero. Wait a minute. Shouldn't I put the sign bit? Biraka? No. What kind of operations are these? Are these arithmetic? Are these numbers? No, they're logical operations, so therefore I'll just fill in with zeros. So the only question is, where should my original 16 bits be? The low end, low, least significant half, or the high end, most significant half? What do you think? 
Who says high end? Put it in the most significant half. Raise your hand. Who says low end? Put it in the least significant half. Majority rules. It's low end. Yeah, it will be the least significant. We'll fill in the most significant 16 bits with zeros when you do this, okay? That's called zero extension. The other thing we talked about is called sign extension. You have to add extra places. You sign extend only with numbers. You zero extend with logical values. You're shaking your head. No, no, no. Did I make a mistake? Oh, I, okay. I thought you were saying hoja, yeah, yok, but such malayan, yeah. Maybe the orson hoja, boshve. Okay. All right. Um, are we okay so far? All right. All right. Shifting operations. We've talked about them. So here we go. Here's the thing again. Here's our R format opcode. RS, RT, RD, shift amount function. Did you notice that in the earlier part of the lecture, we didn't talk about shifting, so we didn't care what that was. Now we care very much what that is, and we actually didn't care what this one was. Okay? Interesting. Some of the fields are used some of the time. Some of the fields are used all of the time. Okay, so now there's... It's useful to include bits in a word. So look what happens here. If I take this T2 value, which is mostly zeros, and then I got some thing, and I take this T1 value, which has got four ones right here, and I order them together, what happens here when I um, have all these zeros and have all these zeros, and I or these bits? What happens when I do that oring? No change. This comes right down here. What happens when I do this oring? You set it to one. So oring allows you to set the bit positions you want to 1. Oring allows you to set to 1 and leave all the others unchanged. What do you think um, anding does? What do you think anding does? Let's have a look here. Okay, I've got a number and I end it with zeros, ones, and zeros. What happened in the red zone? No change, because I ended with 1. What happens here when I end with 0? Ah, ending allows you to mask off and clear to 0. Go back again. In the red, on oring, we set to 1. Outside the red, in ending, we cleared to 0. Ending allows you the power to clear to 0 when you end with 0. Oring allows you the power to set to 1 when you or with 1. That's a real important thing. Can you say that to yourself right now in Turkish? Everybody just talk to yourself and say that. You've got to remember that. I'm not going to repeat it anymore in this course, but you're going to need it a lot. Say it to yourself. Just talk out loud to yourself. Just tell it to yourself. I don't want to. Just tell it to yourself. Make sure you're saying it in your mind and you can say it. You know it, okay? Talk to yourself. Come on. Talk to yourself. Say it so you'll remember it. Okay, all right, that's enough. Now, the next operation is n knotting. And we said that when we want to knot bits, we actually use the NOR operation with the zero register. So here we go. This, this T1 is going to be NORed with zero. And what are we going to get for T0? Have a look. All the zeros became ones, all the ones became zeros. So you NOR with zero in order to invert the bits. Okay? That's one way. It's not the only way. All right, so we've got three things. We know how to mask off bits and make them zero. We know how to set bits to one. And we know how to invert bits using what? Anding, oring, and noring. Okay, so now we're able to manipulate bits and set them or clear them to whenever we want. We can make the ones we want be one, make the ones we want be zero, and invert any that we're not happy with to their other state or leave any alone that we're happy with. Okay, so now when you go home tonight, why don't you make up for yourself a little exercise? Start out with a 32-bit word in some register. And say to yourself, what I want to do with this is leave those alone, invert those, clear those to 0, and set all those to 1. And see if you can create something which brings this here, brings this here as the, the knot of those, brings this here and, and, sorry, clears all those, brings these down and sets all those, OK? It's obviously going to take three operations at least, because you're going to have to have a knotting and an uh, oring, no, sorry, an anding and an oring. See if you can write the necessary assembly language statements in order to do that, OK? That'll be an interesting challenge. If you can do that, then you've got this part. You understand how to do bit manipulation.
Yeah, make it easy for yourself and do them in groups of eight. Later on, we'll ask you more challenging questions, doing them in ones and doing them when they're separated from each other, make it a little bit harder. But right now, just start with groups of eight. Take the first bite and bring it straight through and don't bother it. Bring the second bite and be sure you invert it. Bring the third bite through and make sure you clear it off to zero. Make the fourth bite, whatever it was, make it all ones. Okay? Using anding, oring, and noring. Okay. That's all for the review. Thank you very much. We're done a little bit early today. Uh, are there any questions that you want to ask about this set of slides and this material in chapter two? Okay, uh, my friends, this is the only time in the whole course when you're going to hear something taught twice, okay? You got two hours of it last Friday, two hours of it again today. You can imagine this is a luxury we cannot afford and we will not do this again, all right? So see you next time on, on uh, Friday.